I'll let you get them quiet. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Uh, whether you're here with us this morning or visiting virtually, we're, we're glad you're here. And uh, my name's Art Clue. I'm an elder here. Um, today we're celebrating Pentecost, which is the celebration of uh, when the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles. And uh, it's also known as the birthday of the church. Uh, we're also going to have communion today, uh, which is made possible through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, after the service today, there will be birthday cupcakes in the uh, sanctuary down in, in, uh, just downstairs. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody and having some celebration there. At this time, we would recognize and receive and welcome uh, a new disciple of First Presbyterian Church who's not new. She's been part of our church family, but she said, in her words, I want to make it official. Linda Gordon, would you join me at the communion table? Linda confessed to being a bit shy about standing up in front of everyone. So I'm going to ask you to stand with her in just a moment. But let's just acknowledge what it means to have a new sister in Christ, who again has been part of our church family for years now. Came down uh, with her mother for her mother's care with her sister Carrie. Um, Carrie Gibson is her sister, and they've been active, Linda has, and she said she just felt the ties that bind growing tighter. So I would say to you, Linda, um, that here we acknowledge that we're, we're a family, it's, we're not a membership club, and I would remind the church of that. We're the body of Christ, and we become the body of Christ. We become disciples of Jesus Christ by the work of God in our lives, in our lives together. Baptism, the sacrament of baptism, acknowledges that it's the work of God and the outpouring of God's Spirit. Communion, our unity as a community comes through the work of God, through the Holy Spirit. And so it is the Spirit that brings us here. I would ask that you, Linda, would acknowledge that your desire is to be part of our church through the reaffirmation of your baptismal covenant. I'm going to invite all those who are part of the Christian church to stand with us and answer the questions with Linda so she doesn't have to stand by herself. I would ask you, Linda, and all disciples with her, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, do you? I do. I'm asking everyone. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love, do you? I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love, will you? Amen. You have publicly professed your faith, Linda, with us. I would ask you, but also ask the congregation, your church family, to answer with you. Will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the receiving of prayers? Will you? I will. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ and for our part of the body of Christ, this First Presbyterian Church family. We thank you for choosing to bring Linda as our sister in faith, together with Linda and one another, and with all your people, may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's to him we give honor and glory forever. Amen. At the end of worship, I'm going to invite Linda to stand right here with me and uh, invite you, if you take an extra moment, before you go get your cupcake in the Welcome Center that Art's invited us to, if you would come and just greet and welcome Linda in the spirit of Christian love. All right? Linda, thank you. We'll see you at the end of worship. All right. Check the box. If you would now uh, join me in the call to worship. 
found in your bulletin. All together in one place. It filled the entire house. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you would, please turn in your book, uh, hymnal to 286 and rise. Embody your spirit as you can. Together for communion, reaching the Lord's table and receiving the Lord's gifts, we recite and meditate on the summary of God's law. Our Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. this time I would invite the young disciples to come down front for our time together. I lost my chair so I'm going to have to get down on my knees. Everybody come around here make sure you can see me. Come around. Good morning. Hey, ladies, come, can y'all come around here to the front over here? There you go. Because I want to be able to see you and you see me. Good morning. Oh, let's try again. Good morning. It is a good morning. We're in God's house with God's people. And here, one of the, one of the things that's important for us to remember is that because God loves us so much, God sent Jesus. We sing in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. We sing to Jesus. We give thanks for Jesus. And we tell his story and his stories. One of the things that Jesus gave us, there are a lot of things he gave us, but one of the things was the teaching on how to pray. And I don't know if you remember this. Some of you might have been here. It's been a few weeks when we talked about a prayer that Jesus gave us, a way to pray. He called, we call the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember some of this? And we had motions. So I'm going to encourage everybody now to stand up with me. 
and let's practice the Lord's Prayer. If you haven't learned this prayer, you're going to be learning it. It's a prayer. Now, let me tell you something about this prayer. This, this is a way of talking to God. It's a prayer that people say all over the world every day. All over the world. So this prayer may be prayed as much or more than any prayer there is. But Jesus gave us this. And here's how it goes. I'm going to do it with motion. So I'm going to do it and then you repeat, okay? Y'all ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You repeat after me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Break the bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're forgiving by washing our hands. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we're going to keep working on it. That's the Lord's Prayer. Come on in, guys. Come on in. I'm going to invite everybody to stand. We're going to practice this together. So we can all stand with you, Philip. Y'all come on in. Y'all come on in. Yeah. All right. Y'all ready? I'm going, to, I'm going to do this, and you just kind of follow with me. We're going to learn this. Practice this at home. If you have a young disciple and you want to help them with the Lord's Prayer, to learn the Lord's Prayer, we can do this. And young disciples, you can help our adults learn the Lord's Prayer this way. Y'all ready? Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's good. And that's our prayer for today, but every day you can say that prayer. We'll practice that again. All right, I'm going to dismiss you to extended worship with the Kellers. Mr. Brinson, are you going that way too? Yes. And with Mr. Brinson. All right. This summer, we're going to have young people who are going on mission trips, and I would uh, call on Kari Morgan and youth who will share with us about those mission trips. Working parent, here we are. Can you say hi? Okay. Good morning. Um, I wanted to, let me just go ahead and invite them up, see how long I can make them stand up here. If any of our youth or adults that are participating in any of our summer trips are here today, there's not a lot of them, so I will not make them want to stand up. You can stand up where you are. How about that? But you have to stay standing. There's some more. All right, so we've got a lot. They just got out of school last week, so you're going to keep standing. Um, but just now, there's a lot more that are off at the beach and on cruises and everywhere right now that will be participating with our youth ministry this summer. Our middle school mission trip this summer um, will be, this week is VBS, then we'll go on the middle school mission trip to a place called Tacoa Missions. It's a local camp that's up there, but we will work from the camp um, and go out to the community and do service projects, construction, um, demolition, all kinds of fun stuff we're gonna learn, construction projects, um, for a week up there and we'll get to participate in their camp activities as well while we're there. We'll be home for a week and then the high schoolers will take off to Mobile Bay, Alabama um, to participate in a ministry called Bay Treat. The, the tenors were at just a few years ago, um, right? 30 years ago, a few years ago. Um, 
he talks about the house that we're staying in, how nice it is compared to when he was there 30 years ago working there. But it is a ministry site from the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, they have a house there that they let us stay in, and we go out into the community there in Mobile and work on all kinds of different projects um, and get to experience all kinds of different mission organizations throughout the week. And we'll come back together to worship and um, debrief why we're doing what we're doing, just listening to God's call and how that calls us to come back here and work as well. Be home for a week, and then we'll take off to Montreal Youth Conference in Montreal, North Carolina with our high schoolers with, you know, 1,300 youth from all over the U.S. that will come together to participate in small groups and worship and keynote and recreation and music and come together under a common theme, a common, a common love of Christ. Um, so it's an amazing experience to get to worship with 1,300 youth. And they make friends that they get to go back and see every summer um, and build those relationships from afar. So we've got a busy summer. We're excited to finally have a busy summer. Right? <laughs> um, so that is what we will be doing over the next couple of weeks if you don't see some of us here and there and everywhere. Um, this time of year, which sometimes slows down for some of us in the church, um, on church staff, it speeds up significantly for Kari and for others. You may have a seat, but we have youth virtually. We have youth and other adults who are with them. And I would charge you to serve the people where you're going, to COA, Mobile, and at Montreat, with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I would ask you who are gathered here and represent the body of Christ and First Presbyterian Church, do you as members of this body confirm the call of God to these young people to serve as mission workers in the service of Jesus Christ in the various ministries they'll undertake this summer? If so, respond, we do. Will you support and encourage them in their ministry and with prayer, will you? Yeah. Let us pray a commissioning prayer for all those who will be traveling in work of Christ this summer. Faithful God, in baptism you claim us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading our young people to the time and place of your choosing this summer. We ask that your spirit would be upon Kari and all our adults who walk alongside them. As they go forth this summer, establish them in your truth and guide them by your Holy Spirit, that in your service they may grow in faith, hope, and love, and as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we give honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Kari. I would uh, invite our ushers to come forward at this time, and as they come forward... I would invite you as God's people to prayerfully consider what offerings you bring to God, not just in worship today, but in your daily living as a disciple.
Holy Spirit from God, from Jesus Christ. You merely brush our lives and they are transformed. We ask you to touch our offerings today, to touch our thoughts, to touch our hearts and minds, that we might go forth to share Jesus Christ at home, in the streets, and to the ends of the earth. We make our offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. First, an invitation for the next couple of Sundays. Today started, but the next two Sundays as well, really three Sundays. We have a special opportunity for adults in our Kirk at 9.30 on Sunday mornings. We're looking at one document, one historical statement from the Presbyterian Church's Book of Confessions. And we have a guest speaker, Dr. Chrysler, Channing Chrysler from the Religion Department of Anderson University, who's unpacking this very short but very powerful statement. It's called the Theological Decoration of Barman. It comes from Barman, Germany. It was issued in 1934 in response to the rise of Nazism and the accommodation of Nazism by some Christians at that time, and they made a statement against this. In his presentation, what I found today, just starting, he talks a lot about questions that I hear people asking me in the congregation. Why do we have to read the Old Testament? You should have been there this morning. You can watch it online. We're going to post it and share it that way. What is the purpose of faith in addressing the political sphere? That's what he's talking about, and that's what the Barman Declaration is, is targeted to. John Lummis, the clerk of session and elder, will be joining us the last Sunday of June to kind of talk about that bigger issue. And so, good folks, I invite you to join us at 9.30 in the Kirk. Now, today, Pentecost Sunday, as Art, our elder, mentioned, the birthday of the church because of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, we turn to the passage that describes that first Pentecost, chapter 2 of the Acts of the Apostles. In chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles, we had a promise that Jesus made. Jesus made a promise as, as ascending to heaven, the risen Jesus Christ promises this to the stunned disciples. They're still reeling from his, his being raised from the dead. And he says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you, this is plural, you all, all y'all, is the way we would say this, will be my witnesses at home and far away to the ends of the earth. And so we come to a day after that, as these disciples, soon to be apostles, await the promise, this promise of this power of the Spirit. They wait and they wait until one day, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them heard speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own language we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. 
In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And will, I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless this reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, open our hearts, minds, our ears, and then open our mouths to speak your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I would direct your attention to the bulletin insert, which is our outline for the sermon. And you can uh, track whether I stick to the outline or not. The last time they had been gathered, these disciples of Jesus, the last time they'd been gathered in that way, in, in one room, really like that, that time was full of memories as they looked around and saw each other in that space, they remembered vivid memories and overwhelming emotions. They remembered being gathered in that same way when just over 50 days earlier, not quite two months as we reckon them, Jesus, he washed their feet, which really struck them, still strikes us. He gave them a new command, love one another, and there, Jesus shared the Passover meal with them. The last time they were together like this, he shared the Passover. But he also pointed to a new covenant in that meal. A new covenant through sharing a meal. And at the same time as they were sharing this meal together, Jesus said to them, One, you just don't forget that. You don't forget those kinds of things. They remembered that after that meal, after that last supper, Jesus made his way down and across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's praying, and as he's praying, he's arrested. And within hours, he's beaten and interrogated and condemned and crucified. And soon he's buried in a borrowed tomb outside of Jerusalem. But now they're gathered again. They're all together again. Fifty days after Jesus rose from the dead, fifty days later, the resurrection of Jesus, the singular act of God's love and power, and so they're gathered, they're awed and overwhelmed. After fifty days, they're still awed and overwhelmed. How do you process resurrection mentally, emotionally? They're trying, and they're gathered together again. Fifty days, they've lived with the reality of the resurrection, and they've also received a promise from Jesus. And so while Jewish brothers and sisters and people gather in Jerusalem for the festival of weeks, it's the harvest, early harvest festival, they're gathered in awe, and they await because Jesus made a promise. You're going to be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes. And so, with their powerful memories, they hold on together to the truth of this new life in salvation, crucified and risen. They hold it closely. They're safeguarding God's grace within their inner circle. They have this shared good news, and they're, they're looking at one another and holding it tight in their circle. Fifty days and counting since the resurrection, everything has changed because he has risen. Think about that. He's risen, everything's changed, but here they sit and wait in a circle. What do we do now? Everything's changed, but they sit and wait. They wait on a promise. In the church of Jesus Christ today, we 
profess, we professed with Linda earlier, that Jesus is God's arrival. Jesus is God with us as incarnation. God comes to us as incarnation, that is in flesh. God was in Jesus Christ in the flesh. That's God with us. And today on Pentecost Sunday, God arrives also, we say, as inspiration. Incarnation in the flesh, inspiration as the promised Holy Spirit. God with us as spirit. The biblical word for spirit, both Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament Hebrew, it's ruach. Try saying that five times real fast without coughing. Ruach. There's a throat clearing there. In the New Testament Greek, it's pneuma. But both mean the same thing. They mean spirit, but also they can mean breath or wind. After 50 days, as they sit and wait and wonder what next, God breathes on and into them. Incarnation in Jesus Christ, inspiration by the Holy Spirit. From then on, the church will serve as a God-focused, Christ-centered, and Spirit-powered movement. Anne Lamott says it this way, The Spirit is breath and breezes. The Spirit of God is breath and breezes. And so the first Christians, the 11, and then their extended circle, they experienced the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, God with them in a new way, moving them along just as the wind moves a sailboat or as a deep breath revives someone who is failing. On Pentecost, the believers received the promised filling breath. Have you ever been out of breath? Have you ever lost your breath And that first breath? <gasps> Everything's changed now, but with the arrival of God as Spirit, everything's changed, including them. They're changed. From now on, they are no longer holed up and hunkered down in one place together. They are charged up and raring to go. Charged up and raring to go. My dad loved fast cars. He loved cars, but that meant fast cars. And um, not too many years ago, I heard some of his childhood friends, youth friends, young adult friends telling some stories about him. And let's just say that uh, he liked fast cars. He was a husband and family man when I came to know him. That was a joke. Think about it. My father still loved fast cars, and the closest he got to what he really wanted in a car was a Toronado, an Oldsmobile, 455 engine. And let's just say I was with him in that car on more than one occasion when he decided to open it up. It went pretty fast. But as I was older, he told me, he, he kind of shared with me, he confessed to me, he said, you know, what I really want is a muscle car with a supercharger. Don't tell your mom. But what I really want is a car with a supercharger. And I'm, what's a supercharger? Well, it's, it's an apparatus. It's a mechanism that can attach to engines, not just in cars, but in aircraft and others. Supercharger takes and compresses air and forces it in to the engine so that it ignites with a new kind of power and fury. And that engine performs at a much higher, more powerful level than it ever could. And my dad said, if I had a car with a supercharger, I could really move. But don't tell your mom. But the word got to my mom, and she always said no. My dad never got that car. The Toronado was as close as he got. A supercharger he wanted. Someone has said that the Holy Spirit is the supercharger that enables Christians to do things that folks in the world could never imagine. We suddenly go from being kind of nice people to being the body of Christ in the world. We are transformed. Everything's changed by that spirit, that supercharger, including us. Spirit is breath and breeze. And that sounds kind of nice and pleasant and unthreatening. Spirit is breath and breeze. But think of the loud flapping of a flag on a flagpole on a brisk day. It's so loud, you think the wind is going to rip that flag from its, its mooring. It's going to send it sailing. Think of 
filling up lungs to shout out at the top of your breath. Think of gusting wind filling the sails of a sailboat so full that it cuts through the water. Think of a deep breath, a deep needed breath as you run your race, as you face your challenges, and you think, I can't go any further. And then you get your second wind, and you press on. The same spirit from the very first page of the Bible, the spirit, the spirit that brooded over chaos and brought creation into being, that Holy Spirit fills us with supercharged breath. When the apostles receive what will be called the baptism with the Holy Spirit, what Jesus has called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they don't rent an upper room somewhere to hang out for holiness meetings. That's not what they do. Instead, they go forth into the city streets and the holy temple itself to share the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Him crucified, now resurrected, and now present. God with us, Jesus with us as spirit. In Jesus Christ, God gives us a new life. And they're not just holding it and safeguarding it in a small inner circle. They're taking it out into the world, to the ends of the earth, which was the promise. You will be filled. Remember the promise? Jesus made a promise. You'll be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses right here and over there and to the ends of the earth. And now they're like, well, here's the power. Jesus delivers on the promise. A fresh, filling, holy breath. As they break out of the upper room, this room where they've been staying, as they break through language barriers and begin to share Jesus with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Even folks from far off places in Jerusalem at that time with strange clothes and strange customs and strange cuisine. They're filled by God's own spirit. God with them and their faith their trust in that promise overflows into the streets and it overflows to the ends of the earth and because their faith overflows welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Anderson, South Carolina we're not here because there was no spirit do our lives does our community overflow with faith, hope, and love? Does our trust of Jesus Christ overflow into the world? God comes to us by incarnation in Jesus Christ. In Jesus, in the flesh, God holds nothing back from the world. God gives it all. That's what the cross says. God's giving God fully out of love for the world. That's incarnation. God comes to us by inspiration, the indwelling spirit, inspiration, that's where that comes from. In the Holy Spirit, now that that Holy Spirit has come, we can live without holding back ourselves. We don't have to hold back. Inspired, filled with the Spirit of God, our lives can begin to overflow with good news. We can begin to live a different life. And that's important to remember, but also to pray for, because there's a crisis. Dr. Chrysler this morning talked about contingent crises, crisis of the moment, and how does our faith, how does scripture, and how do our confessions of faith come to bear on the crisis of the moment? What's the crisis of the moment? Well, there are a lot of individual crises, aren't there? We could name them. Some are more the top of your mind than mine or hers or his. We all have, there's many crises. But perhaps for the church, the greatest one is that we're in wait mode. We're waiting on something to happen. We're sitting and safeguarding the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're just waiting. We're just waiting for something to happen. We're honestly, anxiously waiting. And so we try things. We, if we just try harder, if we just do this, if we, if we just paint the sanctuary this color, it'll liven us up. This is the same color it was before we painted it, by the way. We didn't change the color. If the preacher just jumps up and down and makes a little more 
passioned motion as he preaches or she preaches, that, that'll do it. Or if I just find the right investment for my portfolio in this tanking economy, or if I just listen to the right health expert and, and change my diet to the, or take the right supplement. If you don't know about supplements, you're not over 60. <laughs> I know all about supplements. If I, just do, if I just try harder, then I won't be waiting anymore. I will have arrived. Or, or, rather than trying something that we select or identify, trying that harder, trying to do more of our stuff, we could, we could trust the promise of Jesus Christ. It's called faith. And when you have it, it can start small and it grows and overflows. You can trust the promise of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will give you a second wind. It will give you fresh breath. When you think you're out of breath and you're done, it will rebirth you. You can trust that promise. The Spirit is breath and breezes, which frankly always brings to mind that 70s song of my high school days, Summer Breeze. Makes me feel, I won't sing it, makes me blowing like through the jasmines in my mind, which was the cheesiest song. I, don't play that for me to this day. It may be your favorite song. It's not mine. The Spirit is breath and breezes. It sounds, it sounds kind of passive, doesn't it? Pleasant. And it is. Sometimes. Sometimes. But also the Spirit surprises and unsettledness. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is a mighty wind. It's like fire. Its effect is not always nice and orderly or proper, even in our nice, decent church culture. Holy breath can be scary and paradigm-changing, but do not be anxious because that breath of the Spirit fills our lungs and it fills our lives with more than just some commotion What's going on? What does this mean? They said on that first Pentecost day. It's not just commotion. It's a new kind of living. Compassion. This commandment I give you, love one another. And when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus promises, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to live that way. And so every day, folks, we understand that Jesus never promises to solve all our problems. He doesn't. He promises to be with us in the midst of our problems. However weak, however imperfect, however lacking, however limited, I, I'm me, however insignificant we feel, God's Spirit is only a breath away because that Spirit is right here. It comes like a prayer. Folks, every day provides Sabbath simply by holy breathing to breathe the Spirit deeply in and to breathe anxiety out. To breathe in God and breathe out our own fears. Trust the promise Jesus made. Just breathe. Just breathe. But as you breathe in and breathe out, perhaps it can be your prayer. Breathe in. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. Fill, fill us, O oh God. Send us. Bless me to bless others. That prayer will take you far. It will take you far. So practice your breathing this week. Jesus still makes and makes good on that promise if we trust it. Here's the promise. I am with you always. We don't need to wait. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our affirmation of faith. It comes from our featured faith formation focus in the Kirk this month, <clears throat> the Theological Declaration of Barman.
from the Christian Confession Christians of Germany. We're just reading part of it. Let us affirm our faith together. The church's commission upon which its freedom is founded consists in delivering the message of the free grace of God to all people in Christ's stead and therefore consists in the ministry of God's own word and work through sermon and sacrament. May we sing our invitation hymn for communion today, Come to the Table, verse 1. On that first Pentecost day, we read in the second chapter of Acts, Peter, who was shut up in the room with the other apostles, suddenly burst forth and starts preaching in the streets, telling people about Jesus. And at the end of that sermon, if you go to the end of chapter 2, Acts 2.39, Peter says this, The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom God calls. We're going to read those words at the baptismal font next week with baptism. The call is to us out of grace. And the call is to come to God and be with God. And to know that God is with us. And so I invite you to join in our responsive invitation and call to the Lord's table you find in your bulletin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please be seated. I know there are many prayer concerns we all carry. There are also joys, I hope. And I hope we remember to give thanks as well as to ask for God's help. I would ask in the life of this church that we pray for our Vacation Bible School. We commissioned our young people for their many trips and activities this summer. The Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. If we pray for Laura Willette, our staffer. Also for her family as they make their transition to Florida after Vacation Bible School. You're not leaving before then, are you? No. But for all our helpers and all our children, this is certainly one of the most spirited weeks of the year. It's full of uh, faith formation and stories and snacks and so forth. But as we come to the table, let's pray for our Vacation Bible School and also for those people and situations on your hearts. Let us pray to God. Eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe, with the majesty of your hand, you shaped this world. You shaped us. By your Holy Spirit, you breathed life into human form, and you set us humans on earth to praise and serve you. When we wander from your ways, when we're lost in sin's wilderness, your truth burned in the hearts of prophets, powered by the Spirit. They called your people to return to the path of righteousness. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, God incarnate, to be our deliverer. And in every age, your Holy Spirit, your inspiration leads us. You are holy and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son. We remember that at his baptism by John the Baptist, your spirit came with gentle wings and settled on Jesus and gave him your blessing. In Jesus' time of temptation in the wilderness, your spirit stood by with power. In his life and ministry, your spirit led him to serve the poor, to proclaim freedom from sin's bondage, to open eyes, all eyes with faith's sight, and to befriend the friendless and the outcast. In all that he said and did, Jesus announced the coming of your son. At the Feast of Pentecost, you sent your Holy Spirit to the disciples, filling them with joy and boldness. We don't always feel so bold, but fill us with your spirit that we might have greater joy and a new boldness to preach the gospel. Empower us with that same spirit so that we might witness to your redeeming love and draw other people to you. Give us your, fill us with your renewing breath that by our living and giving, 
we may truly draw all people to you. And now we ask that by your Spirit, gifts, granting us communion, oneness with Christ, and in ministry in every place and time, so that the bread we break and the cup we share are for us the body of Christ, and we become the body of Christ in the world. In Jesus' name. And also, in the power of the Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join in our communion invitation, verse 3 of Come to the Table. At this table, we remember that on the night of his arrest, his betrayal, the Lord Jesus was seated at table with his disciples. He took bread. He blessed the bread. He broke the bread. He gave the bread, saying, this is my body given for you. Take, eat. Do this remembering me. In the same manner, after the supper, again with his disciples there, the Lord Jesus blessed and poured the cup Again, he offered the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins, for a fresh start. Take, drink, do this, remembering me. And as the apostle declares, so we trust, hope, and pray, as often as we partake these elements, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again in glory. Today in worship, we're going to invite you to come forward, or you can send someone forward if that's more convenient, if you would ask a neighbor to bring you. We're going to continue to use our communion kits. And if anybody wonders, we're using them up rather than passing the plates today. But there's a kit that has bread on one side, and then you turn it over, and there's a little cup. You'll need to be careful taking the paper off, and then if you would store the paper and not drop it. So I'm going to first ask our, our summer choir and our balcony if you folks would come forward and I would ask our elders to come and share God's gifts in communion. And starting with the back pews of the sanctuary on the ground.
You would turn the bread wafer side up, carefully remove the paper. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we partake the bread of heaven, the promise of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. If you would turn your cup over or pull out your cup, Carefully remove the paper. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the cup of salvation, the promise of Jesus Christ. Would you join in a time of prayer? There's a prayer in your bulletin that we share. Everyone take a deep breath. Let us pray. Spirit of God, breath of creation, wind of change, you pour out your spirit upon us. Open our hearts and minds to new hopes and dreams with the promise of new life in Christ. Open our eyes to opportunities for service and love. Shake things up, spin us around, Show us all that life can be in Christ. Amen. And though it's not marked, please rise and body your spirit for our verse 5 of Come to the Table. Peace of Christ be with you. Would you greet one another in that fashion? Let's just do the last verse. We're going to do the last verse only. Peace of Christ be with you. I should have said that first. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. I invite you to join in our sending hymn. We're going to sing the last verse, the last verse 
of our hymn, You Satisfy the Hungry Heart. So here's the thing about breathing. In the body of Christ, it can't be an occasional breath. That's not going to sustain us. It's not going to see us through. It can't be one person, one person breathing for the body. We've all got to participate in that spirit-led breathing, that prayerful breathing. I invite you to just breathe, but as you breathe in and out, to ask for the spirit to come in and to go forth with you. And now from Romans 15, 13, may you abound in hope through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.